my channel. Now, whether you are viewing from YouTube or listening from our podcast, I pray that you have the, you know, eyes to hear the best from today, as well as the ears to hear the best, as we welcome each of you to another episode right here at DAF's Fourth Friday Hour of Power. Asante, I am MCP and your host, I tell us since 2003, and I'm inviting you, you know, to join us this evening by making sure that you click on subscribe. That way you'll always get your notification to join us each and every for Friday, right here at 7 p.m. You know what? 48 hours. Mm -hmm. Christmas. <laughs> That's right. Are you guys ready? Because Christmas is coming. And um, it kind of makes me think about um, some of the stories I was reared on. And one thing that particular comes to mind. I want to share this with you. It's so small. It says, um, Christmas is coming. The geese are getting fat. Be sure to put a penny in the old man's hat. Now, if you don't have a penny, a half penny will do. <coughs> if you don't have a half penny, then God bless you. And I'm always reminded of that uh, because it's embedded in my head. And this is the way it really goes. Christmas is coming. The geese are getting fat. Please put a penny in the old man's hat. Haven't got a penny, a half penny will do. Haven't got a half penny, then God bless you. Ah, pass it on. <laughs> you know what? Uh, again, um, welcome back. We have some amazing storytellers that's joining us on today. And uh, they will surely leave you breathless for your pleasure. Yes, they're awesome. And it's going to be an awesome concert. Our presenters today, uh, first off, will be John 2, or I should say Mama John 2 and Shani. So, come on, family. Let's go close. All right, Mama John 2 is a downright storyteller who weaves stories from African American history, slavery, Juneteenth, freedom for globes, true life stories about trust, character, hope, preservation, and inspiration. She has performed for historical museums. Uh, the King Atu of Nigeria, Africa, and many libraries, churches, synagogues, so she's all over the place. Yes, yes, that's a good thing. She is clever, engaging as a teller of tales that are so vivid and colorful and with such animation. You'll surely be enlightened and entertained. Mama John Tu, come on, do what you do. about a young boy. He was about uh, 12, going on 13. They lived in the neighborhood. And every weekend, without fail, you can see him coming down the street, pulling his little wagon. <laughs> He's got all his tools, his rake. He even had a push lawnmower. Oh, that was an antique. But he had all kind of little tools, his broom, everything he needed to do a handyman's job. And this would go on throughout the year. Well, he stopped at my house and he said, Mom Jatu, he says, I'm trying to make some money. I said, okay, what are you trying to buy? He said, well, I'm trying to buy a tablet for school. I said, you're trying to buy one of them little fancy gadgets, some computer things that I don't know nothing about. And he said, yes, ma'am. I said, well, how can I help you? You got, I got some work for you. And he said, good. So I had him to do the backyard, you know, rake the grass and do my flower beds. And I gave him 20. And every week you would see the young man walking through the neighborhood, pulling his wagon. So all the neighbors would help him out. Well, he decided that 
around the last of August, he was going to go out to Best Buy Electronics, you know, out on Ford Road in Dearborn. And he went out there and he's looking all around and he's all excited because he's going to get a tablet for school. Well, things begin to change because as he kept looking, the prices were so big. He only had $250 on him. So he's wondering, what should he do? He was really becoming upset and depressed. And suddenly, he had a bright idea. He found the tablet that he wanted and then he put it under his jacket. And then he tried to walk out the store. And ding, 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 ding. Security came from everywhere. They arrested him and took him down the road to Dearborn's finest, the Dearborn Police Jail. Now he's got to call his parents, tell them what had occurred. Then his parents arrived out there. He was so humiliated. He felt like he had let his parents down. And he had. Well, they decided that since this was his first time, that perhaps the judge would be lenient. As long as he didn't get into any more trouble before court started. So he went home, walking out to the car with his head down, because he was truly embarrassed for what he had done. Well, he promised his family that he'd never do anything like that again. And he kept his word. He went back to school, and he graduated from high school. And he had a couple of honors, which was great. And then he was enrolled at Wayne State University. You know where Wayne State University is, down in Midtown Detroit. Oh, he did a fantastic job in college. Did all his work, was well liked by his professors, and soon he heard that President Barack Obama needed some Secret Service men. Well, he was up for the challenge. He got dressed. Well, first he had to go shopping to get the suit. And yes, he got the suit tailored. It was alterated to fit him to a T. He went downtown and got a nice haircut. Oh, the young man was looking good. Looked like he just stepped out of GQ magazine. Went to the interview, had his attache case. Oh, he looked like success. So there were other people, candidates, that were sitting around waiting for their interview. Finally, his turn came up. And he walked into the interview room, and seated were several other people. And they began to question him about the job that he was applying for. And he answered the questions, and he was feeling quite proud of himself. But then somebody started talking. And they said, uh, you want to tell us about uh, 2012 when you uh, went out to Best Buy? That's an electronic store out in Dearborn, Michigan. And the young man began to kind of sink a little bit in his chair because they're bringing up something that he wasn't proud of. And they started saying, do you remember the time? Yeah, you know that tune, the Michael Jackson tune. You went out to Best Buy and you stole that tablet. You put it under your jacket. It was viewed by security on cameras. 
what do you have to say for yourself? And he didn't know what to say. He felt embarrassed, humiliated. The only thing he could say is, I am sorry that that happened. I have learned from that, and it won't happen again. Well, needless to say, he didn't get the position. But he learned a great deal from that experience. Stay out of trouble because it will follow you. Whatever you did, don't think people are going to forget. Somewhere, it's going to come back up. Don't let it happen to you. Thank you. Now, I want to tell you something about gratitude. It just so happened, I woke up one morning. Oh, oh that was a good sleep. And, oh my goodness, look at the time. I got so much to do. My friend's coming to visit me today. Well, we're shopping, I got to clean the house. The linen has got to be brought out. The table has to be set. Oh my, I've got to put some wax on the floor. Well, let me get up and get dressed. So I did just that. Got up and got dressed and I'm ready to go. Well, the first place I wanted to go was Easter Market because it wasn't too far away. And I was going to get some romaine because they have some of the best baked bread. So I've got to get some baguettes and some French bread and some wine and some cheese. Well, let's see. I can get the cheese from the store in the Eastern Market, but I can also get the wine from the wine store that's right there on the corner of Russell and what's that street? Oh, the freeway. So I can get everything. So off I went, got in my car, and I went to Avalon Bakery first and got things that I needed. Then I went to the Eastern Market, and then I went and got the wine. Now what kind of wine should I get for my friend? Well, I think I should get some Merlot. Yes, some Merlot. That's going to be good. And I was really happy when I came back from shopping. I put all the groceries that I had purchased on the table and took off my jacket and hung it up and grabbed my favorite apron and tied it around my waist. And I began to start cleaning the house and pulling out the linen for the table, the dining room table. Yeah, I pulled out my best china. I was so happy and proud of myself. And I said, well, you know, I had the lamb chops. The lamb chops were already prepared. So all I had to do is just warm them up and we'd be ready. And it was sitting right there next to the bag. So I was all set, just running around, humming the tune, I'm going to see my friend. And suddenly, I heard something. Was a knock at the door. I'm looking around, I, I'm not expecting anyone. Who could that be? So I walked to the door and I kind of gingerly peeped out and I saw a man and a woman. I, I wasn't familiar with them, so I kind of gingerly opened the door and said, hello, can I help you? And I saw these two people, and they were grungy, uh, dirty. And the guy said to me, ma'am, do you have any food that we can have? And I thought, well, maybe if he cleaned himself up, he could go out and get a job to, to buy his own food. But I dare not insult this man like that. 
So I said, well, I'm really sorry. I don't have anything. Because the leftovers that I had, I gave to the kids around the corner. Uh, they really liked that stew that I made. And I'm so sorry, I, I don't have anything. I really wish that I could help you. But in any case, I've got to get back because I've got to prepare. My friend, my friend is coming over. So they kind of like dropped their heads and they walked away down the stairs and out to the sidewalk and I kind of watched and then I kept thinking, I've got other things to do. So I put my apron and made sure it was okay and I began to start doing the work that I needed to do. I got the table set and I kept thinking about the couple. And everything would be all right. I had the table set, as I said, and okay, I got everything that I need, but I kept feeling terrible inside because of the way I spoke to them. They didn't deserve that. So before I knew it, I had to take off my apron, hung it up, and I grabbed my jacket, and I put my jacket on, and my scarf, I wrapped that around my neck, and I looked over at the counter, the big shopping bag with the food that I had bought, the tomato and the onions and the dressing and the tomatoes and the, cheese and the wine and of course the tray of lamb chops. I put the tray inside the shopping bag in a plastic bag so that it wouldn't spill over, moved it from the bread and everything. And before I knew it, I was out the door. I stood on the porch, where did it go? And I kept looking and I could see in the distance, they were still walking. And I started walking faster and faster. And it was starting to rain. And it was a little chilly outside. Well, it was very chilly outside. And when I caught up to them, I said, you know, I'm so sorry the way that I talked to you, the way I treated you. Will you please take this bag of food that I had for my friend tonight. I'll find something else. And then I took off my jacket and I put it around the lady and she put her arms in and I helped her to button it up. And then I undid my scarf and put that around her head because it started to rain more. And suddenly, I was feeling happy. And I said, I hope you enjoyed the food. And I started walking back home so I could finish the work that I was doing. Well, as I opened the gate and walked up the stairs to the porch, I noticed on the porch there was an envelope. And I looked around. It's a little late for the postman. So I picked it up and I opened it. And to my surprise, it said, Dear Jatu, it was so nice to see you again. And I want to thank you for the food that you gave us. And thank you for the jacket and the scarf that you put around my lady friend. It was so nice to see you again. Your friend, Jesus Christ. Oh. Wasn't that heartwarming? Yes. Now, the next story begins in Kenya, Africa. There was born a little baby lion, a cub. 
and as soon as it was ready to kind of be separated from its mother, it sold to a circus. Well, they loaded the little cub up on the plane. It was a little cargo plane. And it was going to be about a five-hour trip to Canada from Kenya. So, as the pilot made sure everything was going good, then he said to the little lion, well, off we go. So, the plane took off into the wild blue yonder. And everything was going good. But about four hours into the flight, turbulence began to get quite strong. And the rain, it hadn't been forecasted, but it's a great deal of rain. And the plane was old and really not taken care of. Pilot was very anxious. He started to get terrified. And he said, I'm trying to do the best I can, but I think we're going to have to have a crash landing. And before you knew it, he was calling, Mayday, 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 Mayday. And the inevitable happened. The plane crashed. At the same time, on this island, in Alberta, Canada, there was a woman who was a pianist, concert pianist, and she loved to play Mozart. She had so much land on this island. Well, she owned a whole island. <laughs> it was a great deal of land. Well, she had a rare white wolf who had given birth to a baby wolf and they would spend the time frolicking around and just having fun just doing what little animals do living their life in peace and quiet well this particular day the mother wolf she leaves out of the house. Now let me tell you about the house. It was always open where the wolf and the cub could come in through the door without causing any problem. There was a window in which she had trained the wolf to go up and push it and it would open. She trained that wolf, <laughs> believe it or not, to even take her paw and close it. Isn't that something? Well, it was out traveling around and frolicking when the mother wolf came upon the crash of the plane. And she heard something crying. And lo and behold, helped the little lion to get out of the cage because it was damaged and it was enough room for it to squeeze through. Now he's kind of fat there, but he finally got through that opening and he followed the wolf back to the house. And then she lay down and her baby came to suckle, to eat. Well. The little lion, he was hungry. His tummy was starting to growl. So he did what he used to do with his mother. He went right over there and he found a little nipple for him. And he latched on to that to get some nourishment. Well, soon the lion and the baby wolf thought that they were brothers. And they would run all over the island and they had so much fun. But then, one day, this conservation officer comes to the island. Now remember, this is a private island. 
had signs that said, no trespassing. And him and his friend were binoculars. They were looking around. And suddenly, they spied the great white wolf. So the guy, who was the shooter, puts in the dart. And then he lines it up, and bam, shoots the wolf. They put him in a package, and they carry him out on this boat, and he's gone. Now, the woman is looking for the little, the wolf's mother, but the wolf's mother is not around, and she doesn't know what has happened. They walked all over the island, and the mother could not be found. So now, she has to buy fish, she's got to buy meat, because remember, you have a female who is a feline, okay? You have a feline and you have this male wolf, okay? So, they're both males and they did think that they were brothers and they got along so great. Now, remember the circus? The circus is looking for the baby lion. And finally, they get a lead on the baby lion. Well, how did they get that lead? Well, as the woman was out walking with the animals, she started running and she tripped and she fell on a rock, which made her unconscious. She was unconscious probably the better part of the day, while the lion on one side was growling and howling, and the wolf was doing the same thing. What were they doing? Trying to attract attention from somewhere to get help for her. Well, finally, her uncle, not hearing from her on the phone, decided to take his little bike, his little boat out, and see what was going on. Well, looking with binoculars, on the shore, he could see her on the ground. Now, of course, he's wondering, did they try to eat her? Did they attack her? He didn't know what had occurred. So then he takes his phone and he calls for help. He calls 911 and he calls the park rangers. So everybody comes and, of course, to get to her, they feel their life is being threatened, so what they do is use a dart to tranquilize both of them. And then they take her to the hospital. She was in there two weeks. And finally she starts to come out of it, and she's asking what happened to my little lion and my little wolf? What happened to them? And suddenly she was obsessed like a mother who has lost their children. And she began to look everywhere. And that's when the man, her uncle, told her, well, I did contact the circus. So the circus has them. But they still didn't know where the wolf was. Well, she took off looking for the circus. She traveled many, many miles until she almost got there, but at the same time, the little wolf wanted to know where his brother was. So he picks up the scent and he starts to travel. And finally, he arrives at the circus. And he's sniffing and sniffing, and he sniffs out his brother. And he goes up to the cage, he's standing on his hind legs, and they're like kind of kissing each other, like, you know, where you been? What's going on? So then the wolf heard some noise, some people coming. So instinctively, he went to hide. So he was watching. And as he's watching, he notices that the man is going to open the door to the cage. And at that right time, 
when the man opens the door, he took off and jumped on the man, knocking him down, so that his brother could escape out of that cage. And that's exactly what happened. And the young wolf took off, galloping and galloping, and the lion was right behind him. And once they got a little safe distance, they started to jump up and, and hug and bite each other, you know, showing you know, how they had missed each other. And then they started to travel back home. At the same time, the woman is still looking for the wolf. And she finds that the conservation officer was the one that had trapped the mother wolf, tranquilized her, and took her to this sanctuary with these other wolves. So now, that's going to be a problem. Well, as fate would have it, they finally got to the island. And the woman comes back looking for them on the island. And she finds them. Well, now, the conservation officer wants to know about this baby wolf. And he asks this woman if he can come on her island to discuss it. And she allows it. So she tells him, you know, the wolf and the lion are brothers. Well, <laughs> you know, that's, that's, that's the same. So right away, the guy thinks that she's cuckoo, cuckoo, <laughs> because a lion and a wolf cannot be brothers. Well, after a short time, they saw them together. And the conservation officer saw how well they got along and how they didn't seem to care that one was a lion and one was a wolf. Well, they decided to let the wolf and the lion stay there in the sanctuary of the island where no trespassers could ever come and remove them. Now, the moral of the story is we should be like the lion and the wolf. We should take care of each other as if we were from the same tribe. To take care of each other. What kind of style? Thank you. Johnson, let me join you finally just a little bit. Okay, please. okay, and show you some gratitude. Ah, <laughs> ah okay. that's fantastic. And so, again, much gratitude for sharing with us evening. But I just want to ask you a few things. Um, I know in your intro and your bio it said that you are a uh, storyteller that's Garot. Did I say that correctly? Grill. Grill. Thank you so much. That's Grill. And so from what I've come to understand, you can, you know, help me out here. Um, a Grill is a member, right, of a class of traveling poets, musicians, and storytellers who maintain a tradition of oral history in parts of West Africa. Yes. Yes. And so that came to mind again when you talked about, I would say Kimba the Lion. Remember Kimba? Yes. That was Kimba, wasn't it? Yes, that was Kimba. <laughs> but listen, uh, we so enjoyed what you shared. Tell us how did you become with the love to tell the stories? I never knew I was a storyteller. Mm -hmm. And I began to work at the Charles H. Wright Museum of mm -hmm. African American History. Mm -hmm. And I did tours. Mm -hmm. And I started to intertwine things together. Mm -hmm. Like what happened back then mm -hmm. and what's happening now to show mm -hmm. you know, different comparison of things. Mm -hmm. And people began to tell me that I was weaving tales, that they could just mm -hmm. sit back, close their eyes. Mm -hmm. Of course, a few of them were saying that they stumbled, they couldn't close their eyes anymore. Okay. But they felt 
that stories that I was telling them, they were right there. Very good. And I heard that for five years. Mm -hmm. Now, I believe I am a storyteller. Oh, you certainly know so. <laughs> and so, you know, I, I remember taking that tour at one point in time, and you were the guide, and mm -hmm. you do a fantastic job. As a matter of fact, didn't I sign you up to become a member of DAGS when I was yeah. a teacher? <laughs> yes, you did. And it's been all better for it. We mm -hmm. thank you so much for being a part of the association and sharing from time to time. And so how would someone reach you if they wanted to, um, you know, have you come out and share stories at their events? Well, lucky for me, we've got the Detroit Association of Black Storytellers website. And you can go on there and not only will you see me, you'll see many more of some of the finest storytellers that we have to offer. Well, fantastic. Thank you so much for sharing and once again, gratitude. Thank you. <laughs> oh, fantastic. And so, once again, um, thank you so much for sharing. Gratitude. Wow, didn't expect that type of an ending, but it was wonderful. And I hope that it warmed your hearts as well. And so, let's go to work. Our next teller is uh, Shani, Shani Woman. Mm -hmm. She's a master storyteller, author, educational, consultant, co-pastor, songwriter, recording artist, and a native of Flint, Michigan. She is an artist who writes mm -hmm, music and poetry to bring attention to the environmental racism and inequities in her city and beyond. Now she co-authored with her youngest son a book titled A Nancy and Why the Sea is Salty. This book uh, it ranked number one on the Amazon's bestseller list this past July and going strong. Oh my gosh. Shani is passionate about telling stories by using, you know, different stories to bridge the cultures as they are, you know, divided. Now she's also specializing in personal family stories along with Nancy Folk Tales. Shani. Mm -hmm. Let us hear from you. Hello and greetings. Thank you so much for allowing me to be a part of today's program. I just love the four Friday concerts that DAFS has been putting on all through the pandemic. And this is my first time getting to be here live and in person. So I'm so excited to get started. I have three stories to share with you today. The first one is just a little bit I'll tell you a little bit about me. It's really about my grandmother. You see, I had a Jamaican grandmother. At least that's what I was told, because I never met her until I was 10 years old. That's when my grandmother came to live with us from the island of Jamaica. And when she came into my life, she brought magic. I loved everything about her. I loved the way she walked, the way she talked, the way she smelled. I liked the foods that she prepared, and the clothes that she wore. She was amazing. My grandmother was magical. And one other thing that she brought with her were her stories. My grandmother was a master storyteller. I didn't even realize at the time that all the stories that she was telling me, that they were folk tales, and they were some stories she had heard as a child, and she also weaved in some of her personal stories. I didn't realize how amazing she was. She would tell me all these stories from her memory. She was awesome. And one story that she told me that really brought Jamaica to me in Flint, Michigan, where I was living, it helped me to picture the place where she lived and where my mother grew up and to understand what their life was like. It's called the Linstead Market. Now my grandmother and my grandfather, they were farmers. They had to grow everything that their family needed in order to eat. So they grew bananas and pineapples and coconuts. They grew mangoes and cassava and chocho and ackee and habanero peppers, lots of other things that maybe you've never even heard of like ganep or soursop or prickly pears or OTET apples. They also raised animals like goats and chickens, but everything that they needed to survive, they had to grow it or raise it on their land. 
And so my grandfather and his brothers and the children, they would help to take care of the land, right? They would take care of the crops, they would weed, and they would dig, and they would plant, and they would harvest. But my grandmother, her job was to take all the produce that they created, that they had all grown on their land, to take it to the Linstead Market. Now the Linstead Market was about five miles away from where they lived. They didn't have a car. <laughs> Nobody had a car up in the mountains and the bush is where they lived. It was a very remote place. And so they had to walk or they had to ride a donkey. So on the market days, my grandmother would load up her donkey with bags and sacks with all of the, the produce that they had grown, whatever was ripe, whatever was in season. On this particular day, she had a basket full of ackee. Now, ackee is a very strange kind of a fruit. It is one of the world's most poisonous foods that ever existed. Now, ackee, it grows on trees, and it, it's a yellow or reddish kind of a fruit, and you can't just pick it and eat it. You have to wait until the ackee bursts open, and you see the three seeds, or what we call the eyes, before you can eat it. When it bursts open, it releases the poison gases that are inside, and then it makes it safe for you to eat. So ackee was in season, and so my grandmother had a basket full of ackee. She loaded up some other things, green bananas and plantings on her donkey, and she took one of her children with her, and they made their way to the market. Now my grandmother, often she would carry a basket on her head like this. And when she got to the market, she might set one of the kids up in a stall with some of the produce to have on display to sell. And she would walk through the market. She's what they call a higgler woman. She would walk through the market and she'd call out to the people to let them know what she had inside of her basket. And she might say, Aki, come and get your fresh ripe Aki, sweet and nice. Aki, come now, come quick for it sell off. Or she might have planting. She'd say, plantain, come get your fresh sweet plantain. She could have mangoes, green bananas, whatever it was, she would call it out. And she walked around the market with her basket on her head, selling the things that she had. And now, at the end of the day, after she sold off everything on a good day, she would have money to buy all the things that her children needed. But now, sometimes, sometimes things didn't go as planned. Some days, she went to the market and she and the children weren't able to sell anything. And so they would be sad, they would be dejected, because if they didn't make any money, they, couldn't, they wouldn't have money to buy things that they didn't grow, like maybe shoes for the children or clothes or books for school. And so they'd be sad. But my grandmother, she was never one to be depressed or to get down. She always looked on the bright side of things. And so she said she would make sure that on the way home, she and the children would sing to lift their spirits. Because she said, at least, if nothing else, we, we won't go hungry. We have plenty to eat in our baskets. We'll go home and cook what we have. And the next time, we'll be better. And so she taught my mother a little song. It goes like this. Carry me a go a Linstead Market, not a quatty would sell. What does that mean? Carry me Aki, go a Linstead Market, not a quatty would sell. I carried my Aki, I took what I had to the market, right? And not a quatty, nothing would sell. And then they say, oh Lord, what a night, not a bite, what a Saturday night. Or they say, oh Lord, what a night, not a mite. What a Saturday night. A mite is like a penny, a dime. They didn't have anything. But the singing would help them to feel better. And so I learned from my grandmother and from another famous Jamaican that when things don't go the way you expect, don't worry. Don't be sad. Don't worry about a thing because what? Every little thing is going to be all right. All right, the next story I have for you was one I learned from my grandmother. This was not a story about her life, but this is an Anansi story. She shared with me many Anansi stories 
This one is called Anansi and the Magic Pot. One day, there was a great famine in the land. You see, there was a drought. It had not rained for many, many months. And the ground had become hard like a rock. And it was dusty. And all the crops in the fields began to dry up. And now Anansi, he lived in the countryside. And he, along with all the other families who relied on their crops to survive, began to struggle to find food. Now, Anansi and his wife had six little children that they had to feed. And so every day they would go out in their fields and they would try to dig into the hard dirt and maybe find a few potatoes or yams or cassavas that had been left behind. And so they were able to just scratch out enough, dig up enough to survive off of. So whatever they would find, his wife would roast it up, roast up the bananas, the, um, the potatoes, the yams, whatever they would find. And the kids would eat, they would share it among each other. And everyone only got about a tablespoon, and sometimes a handful of whatever vegetables or fruits that they found on that day. And so every day, the same thing, over and over, they would go out and try to find a few ears of corn or a few bananas, whatever they could find in their fields or along the way, along the roads, there may be things growing that maybe someone left behind. One day, Anansi was out and he just, he couldn't seem to find anything on this day to take home to his family. He looked and looked and he had been out for hours and all he found was two measly bananas and he stuck them in his pocket. And he made his way down by the river to get a drink because it was hot and so he said, well, I'll get some water and refresh myself, splash them on my face and maybe I'll get an idea of where else I can go to look for something to eat. So he was kind of getting sad and as he walked along, he shuffled his feet and he happened to be not looking where he was going and uh, he stumbled upon something and he looked down. What, what is this? Uh, it was a pot. It was a magnificent looking pot. It had all these strange markings on the outside and he wondered what they could mean. He looked at it. It, was an, it looked like an ordinary pot, but it was beautiful. The designs on the outside were gorgeous. And he said, my Lord, what a beautiful pot. And do you know what happened? The pot said, don't call me beautiful. <laughs> Anansi was shocked. He said, well, what should I call you? The pot said, call me, do make me see. Hmm. Anansi thought that was strange, but he didn't have anything better to do. So he said, all right, do. Make me see. And with that, the pot began to shake. It began to rumble. It began to bubble and boil. And as Anansi looked into the pot right before his very eyes, it began to fill with food. There was a heaping mound of coconuts, rice with peas. Oh, one of his favorite dishes. And then he looked again, and there was a delicious helping of curry chicken to go with the rice. Anansi had not seen such a, a delicious meal in such a long time before he knew it. <laughs> he ate it all up. And it was gone, and Anansi was, he was so surprised. He said, that was delicious. How often do you perform? And the pot said, as often as you like. But just be careful that you don't wash me. Because if you wash me, you will wash away the magic. <laughs> Anansi said, no problem. He had no intention on washing the pot. He was a little bit lazy. So he took the pot and he put it back. And he hid it under some bushes near the river. And he said, this will be our little secret. <laughs> and he went home to his family. And he took the two little bananas out of his pocket. He gave them to his wife. She shared them with the children. When it was time for dinner, and she gave everyone their portion, she offered Anansi a small piece of banana, and he refused. He said, oh, no, no, no. I don't want to take any food from the children. Give them everything. So she did, and Anansi went to bed. She thought, hungry. That night, Anansi 
tossed and turned. He could barely sleep as he thought about what the pot may prepare for him the next morning. <laughs> Bright and early, he leaped out of bed and he made his way down to the river. And he looked, made sure nobody followed him. He looked and he grabbed the pot from under the trees and under the bushes. And he said the magic words, he said, do make me see. And once again, the pot began to bubble and boil and rumble. And this time, oh, this time it prepared for him the Jamaican gold standard for breakfast. It brewed up a heaping helping of ackee and salt fish with green bananas and fried dumplings. <laughs> it was a breakfast fit for a king. Aki and saltfish, one of his favorite dishes. And before you know it, mm, Anansi ate it all up, none was left. He turned the pot down, he went out to find a few scraps to give to his family. This went on for many days, until finally one night after dinner, Anansi's oldest son said to his mother, he said, Mama, have you not noticed that although Papa does not eat anything with us, his belly is growing rounder and fatter and bigger, even though we never see him eat. Mama said, hush up now, boy. Respect your father. But she began to take note of her husband, and she decided to watch him a little more closely. So the next morning when Anansi sprang out of bed and made his, dad, his way down to the river, you know what happened. <laughs> his wife followed him. She stayed behind and she hid behind the bushes. She saw him go down towards the river. She saw him peek behind the bushes and take out a pot. She saw him talking to this pot. She saw him eating from the pot. And she said, oh, so that's your little game. <laughs> Two can play at this one. And so as Anansi left, he turned the pot down. He went on his merry way. As soon as he was out of sight, <laughs> his wife snuck down to those same bushes and she pulled the pot out from behind the trees. And she looked at it, she said, my, what an unusual pot. It's very strange, but it is beautiful. My, you are a beautiful pot. And the pot said, don't call me beautiful. <laughs> well, what should I call you then? Said Mrs. Anansi. The pot said, do make me see. So she said the word, she said, do, make me see. <laughs> Which means show me what you can do, right? And the pot began to rumble and bubble and boil and it brewed up a big heaping helping of red beans and rice with fried plantain. Miss Anansi took the pot and she ran home as fast as she could and she shared it with all her children. Everyone ate and ate and ate until their bellies was full. <laughs> they were so full they could not move. They laid around in the living room and they rubbed their tummies and they thanked God for such an amazing meal. Now Mrs. Anansi, she was very neat and tidy. So, of course, she had to wash the pot. And as she made her way to the kitchen and she had a nice hot tub of dishwater waiting, the pot said, no, don't wash me. She said, of course I have to wash you, I have to wash. And before the pot could say another word, she dumped it uh -uh, under the dishwater. She washed the pot thoroughly. She cleaned it so it shined on the inside. And she turned it down, set it on the sink to dry. A little while later, Brother Nancy comes in. He sees the family laid out, rubbing their bellies. And he said, what is going on? I only found a cup of potatoes for dinner tonight. And he said, oh, Papa, we already ate. You already ate? And he said to his wife, what, what, what does this mean? What do you mean you already ate? Oh, <laughs> it's a long story. But you know how I believe in my dreams, right? <laughs> I had a dream that there was a pot down by the river under the bushes full of food. And so when I woke up this morning, I went to the court. And sure enough, there it was, just like I saw it in my dreams. And I brought it home, I fed the children. And that is how we all had a wonderful meal. And I also said, where? is the pot. Oh, I have it here, I have it here, don't worry, I've got the pot right here. Woman, where is the pot? 
She said, it's in the sink, Anansi, calm down. No, you didn't, you did, you did not wash the pot. He ran, he picked up the pot, he looked inside. It was clean as a baby's, a newborn baby's bottom. Anansi was so vexed, so upset. He did not speak, he did not eat for many, many days. And over time, his limbs began to shrivel up. But his belly stayed big and round. And that is why spiders have big round bellies and little shriveled arms. It is Anansi who make this. <laughs> Jack Mandora may not choose none. <laughs> and at the end of every Anansi story, we say Jack Mandora may not choose none. Just calling out, talking to Jack Mandora, who they believed in that day was the keeper of heaven's gate. And so you would talk to Jack Mandora and say, may not choose none. I did not make this story up. I'm just telling you what was told to me. So don't charge me with lying when I get to heaven's gate because I'm just telling you how I was told. <laughs> I got one more nasty story for you real quick since it's Christmas. I thought we'd do a Nazi and sorry. I have my little prop back here to help me out. Now, this was Christmas Eve morning. A Nazi rose up early because in Jamaica, Christmas Eve morning is not only Christmas Eve, it's also Grand Market Day. That means that everyone in the countryside will go and harvest up anything that they have left in their fields and they go to the market and they try to sell off everything to make money for their Christmas feast and to carry them on into the new year. So this was a big day and everybody was up early rushing about and packing up their donkeys and baskets and, and bags to carry to the market to see what they could sell. And Anansi stood in his doorway waving to everyone as they made their way to the market. He would say, Happy Grand Market Day! And they'd say, Happy Grand Market Day, Anansi! And he waited and waited until everyone had left to go down to the market. Just as they left, he made his way to his neighbor's feet. This year, Nazi had been a little lazy, you know. Sometimes he didn't care much for working, and so he hadn't planted anything this year in his own field. So he went next door to his neighbor's field, and he looked around. He said, he has to have something left in the fields that I can scuffle, that I can kind of just glean and take and go to the market and sell to make me a little money. So Nazi went, he went to his neighbor's yard, and he looked. He searched and searched, nothing there. He said, what a hard people. They not leave nothing for the poor. Mm. Anansi was upset, but he said, I know, I'll go down to Mas Elik's field. Mas Elik is a good man. I know he left something in the field for the, for the widows and for the poor and for the orphans. So Anansi went down hoping to glean something from the field. And he looked and looked again, he found nothing. He went on down the road. Every field was clean. There was nothing left for him to scuffle. So as he made his way down a little further, he happened to see a little plant growing. And it was red, a nice beautiful red. The leaves were green, but there were red flowers. He said, what is something here? Me never seen you before. And so he said, what's your name? <laughs> but the plant said nothing in return. And Nancy said, you know what? I think I will scuff for you. Since I have nothing else. So he began to pick some stems off of that plant. And he tucked them, tucked those into the waist of his pants, and he had some in his arms, and he made his way to the market. Once he got there, the market was jam-packed. There were people everywhere. And he only could find one little spot in a stall next to a lady who was selling O-T-E-T -E apples, which were bright red. And Anansi said to the lady, hey, ma'am, how about if I swap you some of my red things for some of your red things? He was thinking, at least I'll have some apples to, to take home to eat. And she said, what that? What you call that? Anansi said, Swap me first, and I tell you. She said, no, 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 tell me first, then I swap you. And as they bickered back and forth, the lady standing next to her said, why you sit here and argue with the little man? 
The little weird man, take the thing from him, snatch it from him, take it. And Nasi said, take it if your name bad. <laughs> and with that, he took off running and he ran away. And the ladies chased him. And they said, stop, stop him, stop him. And people saw him running with this handful of red somethings. They did not know what it was. And then one man, you know how people are so fast that they try to get involved and they don't know what's going on. One man saw the lady saying, stop him. He yelled out, thief, thief, stop the thief. Because he thought Anansi must have stolen stuff. So then he made it his business to chase Anansi down. And Anansi ducked under people's legs and went under stalls and jumped over tables and he ran all through the market zigzagging. And as he made his way to the last stall, there was a woman there, the Hominy woman. She, was, she had a big giant tall pot on the fire and she had water boiling and she was just about to put in a batch of Hominy corn meal to make a big batch of porridge. You know Jamaicans love their porridge. And she was going to sell that. But before she could put in her corn meal, Anansi threw the batch full of sorrow into the pot. <laughs> My God, the woman looked into the pot. She said, oh, what that? What that? In the pot, what that you put in the pot? He said, just, just wait and see, just wait and see. She looked in the pot again, she said, it, it turning red, it turning the water red. And Nancy said, me no, me no, just, just wait a minute, wait a minute. And she said, it looked like wine. And Nancy said, it better than wine. <laughs> and people began to gather around and say, what is this thing? And Nancy said, you have to wait, you have to wait and see, because he did not know what this was. Right? He prayed that I pray this is not poison to kill anybody. But he had to keep it up because everybody was watching him now, so he kept up the act. And he said, this thing is so real. Once you taste it, it would change your life forever. <laughs> And so a man, the man who chased him down, came up and he grabbed a big spoon and he dipped up some and mm, it's no good, no good. And Nasi said, it's not done yet, you have to wait, make it brew. And so as the pot bubbled and boiled, it turned a beautiful dark burgundy red. And Anansi stirred it and he stirred it and he stirred it so he took a taste, he said, mm, it needs some spice. So he threw in, he said to the, the how many woman, let, let me borrow some of your spices. She had all the spices to add to her porridge sitting right there. So he grabbed some of her cinnamon and he threw it in. Before she could even say yes, he grabbed it and he threw it in and he stirred it and he stirred it and he stirred it. So then he threw in some nutmeg, he grated some nutmeg and dropped it into the pot. Then he looked across, there was a lady at a table across. He said, miss, give me a piece of your ginger. So she threw the ginger over, he cut it up, he added it to the pot. He stirred it, and he stirred it, and he stirred it so till Anansi began to sing. He said, you stir it, and you stir it, and you stir it so. You stir it till it's sweet and nice. Once you taste it, and you taste it, it tastes so right. You say it is so real. <laughs> it's so real. And so people heard him saying this so real. They said, what did, what did he say? What did he call it? Somebody said, I think he said sorrel. And Anasi said, it's so real. But they couldn't hear him clearly because Anasi has a lisp. And so they thought he said so real, but he said it's so real. And once it was finished, he began to dip it up in cups. He gave it to the man who chased him down. He gave it to the lady who made, who was making the porridge there. And they both tasted They said, this is wonderful. This is delicious. What a beautiful, lovely, warm drink. The man said, this is better than wine. <laughs> and the woman said, this tastes like Christmas. And after that, Anansi began to charge everybody one penny for a cup of his new drink that was so real. And that is how so real became sorrel, which became the Jamaican Christmas drink. It's Anansi who make it. Jack Mandora, Menachu.
I know you said you got the love from your grandmother. I also became a teller because of what's passed on. But um, to continue on with it, you write the books, got the best selling. You know, you shared so much with us on today. So we thank you for bringing information from Jamaica. But tell me, what does it for you? I know your grandmother passed it on, but every grandchild doesn't get it. Right. How did you know that you had it? Um, I just, I think I always have been drawn to stories. Mm -hmm. But as a child, I struggled in learning how to read. But I love listening to stories. I would love mm -hmm. just listening to her and my aunties, my mother. Mm -hmm. They would share stories. And I always enjoyed listening, but I had a hard time reading. And, you know, back then they didn't really test you for dyslexia and things like that. So I think I was dyslexic. And so fast forward, mm -hmm. I have three sons, and two of my sons are dyslexic. And so I saw them struggling with reading. I remember how much I love stories. And because I love stories, mm -hmm. I would go to the library, even though you know I might get books that are a lower grade level than what I was at, but I would love to go to the library and pick up books so I can have some more stories, right? And so I started taking my kids to the library, and I would read them stories. And then I thought, well, you know, a better way to hold their attention is to act out the story, to use props and to use voices and, you know, help them. I wanted them to know about Jamaica and know about our family and our culture. So storytelling was one way that I started to do that with them. Mm -hmm. And then their teachers would ask me to come to their school and tell a story or, you okay. know, the church or community center. So that's kind of just one thing led to the next. But it started with my kids as a way to help mm -hmm. them um, become readers and, and love stories themselves. Oh my gosh, obviously you've done a fun, wonderful job. Bestseller? Again? Okay. And the name of your book, that's the bestseller on Amazon? The book is by me and my son Ande, so uh -huh. Shani and Ande Womack. It's called A Nazi and mm -hmm. Why the Sea is Salty. Oh my gosh. We thought we'd make some new adventures <laughs> for a Nazi, right? <laughs> These stories are old, old stories from Africa, but we said we need some new American adventures for a Nazi. Nazi. No problem. And so Anansi embodies the spirit and knowledge of, you know, told tales. And what is that catchy ending to all the Anansi stories you shared with us? Jack Vandora. Jack Vandora. Me not choose none. Jack Vandora. Me not choose none. Oh, I choose I none. I didn't choose this. <laughs> and I didn't choose this. I'm just telling you what the books told me, right? No problem. Well, we thank you for sharing again. And uh, how would one reach out to you if they wanted to, you know, retain you for stories, for events? Yes, no. Absolutely. Um, our book is on Amazon. Mm -hmm. um, you just can look up um, mm -hmm. Nancy and Why the Sea is Salty. Mm -hmm. um, also, I have a website, shinywomack.com, mm -hmm. but I'm also on the DAF site. So that's a place, a great place to start to uh, reach out to me and get in touch with me. Well, that we will do, I'm sure. You guys heard it. So thank you so much. Mm -hmm. And uh, again, look forward to you coming back to tell more stories, even Nancy. It's okay. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much. Well, folks, there you have it. That concludes our programming on today. You know, many thanks to our sensational tellers. We actually kind of went around with, well, we heard stories, you know, from Mama John II, uh, West Africa, and of course, Shining from, you know, the Caribbean, from Jamaica. Okay, and so there's so many different types of uh, stories that each of us embodies. Some do different types uh, that are children, uh, adults, uh, American, African American, all sorts. So you never know what type of tellers we're going to have on the show. But again, the common ground is to share the stories, to keep the stories going from generation to generation. So thank you so much to both of you. Thank you for the behind the scenes crew for doing what you guys do each and every month. Uh, again, special thanks to the Hannah Center, and that's for allowing us to present our monthly stories here again, right here in the beautiful Black Box Theater, located at 4750 Woodward Avenue in Detroit, and of course, Michigan. And last but not least, certainly not least, special thanks to each of you for, you know, continuing to tune in to us hear what we have to share each and every month. And again, if you have enjoyed our stories, not only just today, but from other episodes, please, you know, help us out as far as uh, to keep the uh, storytelling going by donating. 
yeah, go to our web page, or you can go to our PayPal page, actually donate, or you can become a member. And again, our website is thedetroitstorytellers.com. Sign up. You know, you can always view the past show as well as to see what our upcoming events are. And if you're having an event and you need, you know, a little dab of entertainment or a little dab of uh, education, just contact us again. DetroitStoryTellers.com or you can call us by phone 313-442-DABS uh, three one three four four two dabs that's 313-442-DABS uh, D-A-B-S and just request our services we have tellers obviously uh, workshop leaders uh, hosts MCs whatever you need all themes all ages and I can't remember a little dab will do you again I am Pamela Tell us in 2003, and your host uh, reminding each of you through this season, uh, you know, hang off the mistletoes. If you do that, you'll get to know each other better. When? This Christmas. Mm -hmm. And as we trim the trees, all together, how much fun it's going to be. Yeah, when? This Christmas. As the fire signs are blazing bright, we're caroling through the night. And this Christmas, yes, it will be a very, very special Christmas uh, for you and for me. You know, and the main reason why it's going to be a special Christmas for you and for me is because Jesus is the season, yes, for the reason. Uh, he's the reason for the season. So I want to bid you all a Merry Christmas. Yes. Have a happy Kwanzaa and uh, a Sante. But most of all, may God bless. Thank you.